Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism weekend show. Hope you and yours are all well. Um, we've got a good show for you again this week, I hope. I hope you're all going to enjoy it. First things first, uh, Mr. Boswell can't be with us today. He's serving a two-match suspension. No. He's actually, as we speak, he's on, on a plane en route to Spain. And my liver is already screaming. Um, so he'll be, actually next week when we do the show, he'll be, he'll be here. In a different room, probably. Anyway, but let's bring in uh, our, our guest tonight, and uh, starting with our favourite lawyer, it's our Eva. Eva, Hi. my darling friend, how are you? Um, I want to say I've had a great week, but this wasn't it. There's just been too much tomfoolery and nonsense um, in politics for one week, so I'm really looking forward to getting ripped in about it tonight. That's what we want to hear. Let's get ripped into them. And also to do a bit of ripping, it's our favourite weatherman over there in Edinburgh, an old Ricky. It's Lloyd. Lloyd, how are you, my friend? I'm well. I'm very well. You've not been a weatherman for you... 27 years, though, but there you go. Uh, you'll always be the weatherman <laughs> on here. And are you in the mood to rip into people tonight? Oh, another... Uh, what are we? We're back at the same shop, selling the same goods, you know. Sick. Yeah. We'll talk about the change, folks, that you all voted for. <clears throat> Um, and a favourite of the show, um, or from not my parliament fame, it's our Alan Petrie. Alan, Hi, my Roger. friend, how are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. Uh, looking forward to running many campaigns. Actually, going away to Perth tomorrow for a yes picnic in the park. So, oh. getting people back on, on track now. So, we like to hear. And we've got a newbie for you, folks, someone you're all, a lot you'll be very, very well, well aware of. Uh, an excellent. Uh, Human being in person does an awful lot of great work. It's Anne Marie Ward. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me, Roddy. Delighted to be here. It's an absolute pleasure. I hope you're still thanking us at the end of this. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Don't you worry, you're among friends. It's been great. But it's been a heck of a week, as you say, Eva. And you know, to give you your first topic to get ripped into. Um, the SNP this week, Techie Kiddie called for a four Four Nations uh, Summit to talk about eradicating poverty. Hmm. Have we got a wee picture in that, Techie? Maybe not. Um, and also this week, at the same time, Eva, uh, Stephen Flynn sent a begging letter to um, to Starmer. At, you know, can we have some more, sir? It really is just quite nauseating. This is the letter. Do you get it? I don't know if you've seen it, folks, where he, he's asking, uh, begging the, 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 the Labour Party to do things like get rid of the two, the two clause rape, child rape clause. Um, it's just, they don't stop, do they, Eva? We could spend the entire prism um, tonight speaking about these topics alone and we would still not do them justice. The Scottish Government set up a Poverty and Inequality Commission in 2019. They meet regularly, they provide reports and their job is to advise the Scottish Ministers as to how to go about eradicating poverty in Scotland. And I cannot for the life of me understand why the leader of a party whose job is to attain independence for our country is talking about a summit involving the other nations when what he should be doing is a fighting for independence so that we can with the full economic powers that only independence can bring seek to eradicate poverty and inequality give our people hope and real change not the kind of change that others have promised and then fail to deliver and he should in particular be talking about what it is that the Poverty and Inequality Commission has already achieved for Scotland. And he should be putting his money and John Swinney's money, because it's our money, where our mouths are, and actually addressing child poverty. Because what we know, everybody knows. If you 
are as a child living in poverty, if you're born into poverty, that affects your physical and mental health and well-being and development for your whole life. It affects your future life chances. It affects all sorts of stuff, including your ability to be educated. It has an impact in relation to whether you're more likely to be involved with the children's panel system and the like. The effects of poverty in childhood are enormous and should never, ever be understated at any time. The real tragedy here is that the Scottish Government can address the two-child rape clause overnight. It can mitigate it. It has to mitigate it because we're a colony. We're not independent. It could remove it altogether with independence. But in the meantime, the mitigation would cost off the order of £100 million or so per annum. That is a very small percentage of the budget of the Scottish Government. But the reason that they won't do it, I think, is because they want to continue to blame Westminster for issues that Scotland is actually able to address. And it's perhaps also because, unfortunately, many of those people who live in poverty don't vote. They're either not on the register or they're not motivated to vote because they don't think that politicians are in it in the main for the right reasons. And what we've seen in the past few days would strongly suggest that those views are genuinely held. So there is much that the Scottish Government can do. There is very little that they will do. But Stephen Flynn should hang his head in utter abject shame that what he's doing yet again is replaying the Oliver Twist mentality and pleading with Keir Starmer for a little bit more. He was warned repeatedly by all of us and by many other people before the election that Labour would deliver nothing for Scotland that was worth having if it was going to big up the SNP or the potential of the people of Scotland and that's exactly where we are. Labour will deliver to Scotland when there is something in it for Labour enabling them to retain power. That's what they're about, that's why they're a political party. Their priorities are them and their power not the good of the people of this country. Because if it was, those Labour MPs elected in Scotland, and I think there's 37 of them, but one of them didn't register a vote, 36 of them voted to retain that two-child rape clause. That's what Labour in Scotland is today, people, and don't ever forget it. Yeah, and actually, it was Shanks that moved the motion at Westminster. Uh, which just sums them up. I, as I put out a tweet saying that's good, but make the procurator fiscal's jobs easier when the, the charges come after independence. But Lloyd, we've had this discussion on here lots of times that, um, you know, we, you play by the British rules, you ain't going to win. Now, Flynn, the first after, the, immediately after the election, was kowtowing, as our friend Phil would say, to the Mr. Speaker, wanting to be, please, please, can I be your friend? Please, can I be your friend? And can we let bygones be bygones? Now he's finding out the Oliver Twist bowl. They don't learn, do they? They can't win playing British rules. No, in, indeed they can't. Um, it's as I said in, at the beginning, it's, it's business as usual, Roddy. I mean, mm. the whole way that he, 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 when he, when he spoke about Lindsay Hoyle, that, that whole thing was the fact that he'd lost two thirds of his parliamentary group only a few days earlier seemed no longer to be of any interest. And they've moved on so, so quickly. I mean, you, 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 you compare that um, in, in reference to, for instance, Sinn Féin took part in an election the same day as we did. They did better uh, than they had done at the last election, but they didn't achieve what they thought they would achieve. Within 48 hours, they had convened an expert group to look at what went wrong and why they didn't win bigger, not why they lost why they didn't win bigger. And the results of that review were produced 96 hours after that. Now, that's a political party operating under principle. And I was just going to part of the reason I said that is I want to, would like to, you know, when, when, when Flynn's letter went out, copies of it went to Sinn Féin as well. And I cannot imagine how much hilarity and laughter would have been in the Sinn Féin office when they were suddenly handed a letter saying, you've got to go to a meeting with these jumps. Uh, along with the British, uh, you're going to address child poverty. When they're sitting there going, 
but you lot don't know how to do any of this. You really don't understand what's going on. I mm. mean, it, to me, both the creation of the Commission in Scotland, which is, is another example of the Scottish Government using a client structure to deliver its 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 policies. You combine that with 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 Flynn effectively saying, "Let's get together and see how we can reorganise the poverty business," because this is what this is all about. This is not about addressing poverty. That should be, if you're in politics and you want elected, surely you have a list of priorities of the things that are wrong in your country and you want to address them. And surely, one of the first things that for any member of the Scottish National Party is the knowledge that. Since 1999 and the creation of the Scottish Parliament, one in four children in this country have been living in poverty. That hasn't changed in 25 years. Now, we know the reason for that, because you don't, we don't have control of our economy. But surely, when you get elected, right at the top of your priorities is the knowledge that that statistic that shames us all is the thing that you have to address firstly and most foremostly. But unfortunately, it does not seem to be within the ken of the leadership of the Scottish National Party to realise that there is a mission here. Being the leading party of the movement, they are not a political party in a British sense, even though they behave in that manner. They need to get away from this and get back to where they should be, which is to address the problems, find the solution. And if the solution is independence, then that's what you campaign for to address the central problems. That's all I've got to say. No. Anne-Marie, you, um, welcome to the show again. Um, you every day are dealing with the, the, the fallout from poverty. And I think there's, it's well seen there's a link between poverty, drug addiction, and alcohol addictions, etc. When you saw that, you know, calling for a four, a four nation summit, did that encourage you in any way, or did it just you just shrug your shoulders and go, here we go again? No, well, thanks, Roddy. And I think what I've got to say, maybe not be very palatable here, but to this particular audience, but I think I do represent a significant amount, a number of people who have voted for independence their whole life. And I think now that that dream has been set back for our generation, I think it's still a very noble goal but it's a long, long-term project and we can't afford to wait until, you know, till we get that. And we can't afford to continue to play the, the blame game while people are suffering. And to be honest, when I saw this idea of a Four Nation Summit um, on eradicating poverty, I did think to myself, you know, about the poverty industry and how, how well that is funded, you know, how many jobs are involved in that. But I do think that there is an urgent, a really urgent problem here in Scotland. Obviously, we've got the highest drug deaths um, in Europe and in arg arguably the world, you know, depending on the statistics that you look at. And, and we really do need immediate action to help those who are in desperate need. And I, I'm sorry to say this, but I'm resigned to the fact that working collaboratively, collaboratively, sorry, with anybody who's willing to help is the best way to achieve that and i'm just sick of seeing all the political parties play football with people's lives no i absolutely agree with you that is the problem it is an industry and it's like i suppose like big pharma you know if you if you cure everybody then there's no business um so there doesn't seem to be that um urgency alan uh, you've seen poverty up close and uh, you see what what's going on does the four nation approach and uh, more of the same encourage you in any way? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> I mean, how many of these uh, reports have we had? Uh, how much money has been spent on these reports? Maybe if they stopped spending money on these reports, we'd have enough money to actually eradicate the poverty. I'm sick and tired of talking shops just to make people look like they're doing something. I remember being a counsellor, and if you were sitting at a meeting, and you didn't agree with something that was getting put forward, but you didn't have an amendment to go forward to counter it, you would ask for a report because it was simply delaying the situation, but making it look like you were actually doing something. Asking for reports is just wishy-washy clock trap. It's time to start to take action rather than words, because we're sick and tired of the words. 
Now, that there's actions that the Scottish Parliament could take right now. They could remove housing debt. That way they could cut the housing uh, rent. They could scrap the debt for school meals and then introduce a universal free school meal system. They could bring water back under local government, removing the quango so as the water charges could be caught up under the benefit system. They're all small bits of money, but it's large amounts of money that's going to go in to help someone live their life and increase their household income. That's what we should be doing. Asking Westminster to help, it's just a waste of time. Blaming Westminster is just a waste of time. Let's use the resources that we have now and show the people of Scotland how competent our government can be. And then perhaps we will get independence very soon. Yeah, but I, I agree and I, you know, and I salute that in every way, but our government in Scotland has shown itself to be completely incompetent. Yeah. You know, and and you know, you know, I, in the last year or so, I've found myself thinking, why am I paying for two bad governments? Because mm -hmm. that's what we have. You know, that's what we've had for the last 14, 15 years. Why am I a taxpayer paying for two bad governments? Yeah, why are we all doing it? It's absolutely true. Um, they are bad, but all is not lost because this week, our new viceroy. That well-known Scottish-born English nationalist Ian Murray appeared to have a massive amount of money, which I think could have been better spent on poverty issues, but for the space industry to get a headline, stick it up, take it, there you go, 10.9 million to boost Scottish space sector. Now, I don't want to be sneering any money spent to create help any job in Scotland, I'm all behind, but 10.9 million for any space business doesn't even scratch the surface. This was all about a headline and not really about anything that was going to benefit the Scottish people, was it? It was just about capturing a bit of publicity for himself and looking like the big man instead of the space cadet that he actually is. I mean, hopefully people will, will Google Taysiders from space and they'll see what I mean. <laughs> I'm like you. Um, I would absolutely welcome any kind of sensible investment, but you've got to get your priorities right. This is the party who will retain Trident. Their priorities are not in the main, the priorities of the people of this country. And no. for his first grand announcement to be about you know, Star Trek in effect, probably gives us a fair idea of what's going to be happening over the course of the next few years. Um, no. What he would have been better doing, he and every other Scottish MP and MSP should have been sitting reading the report that was done last year about the children's hearings system. Um, and there's, a, I think Techie's got a, a picture there about a quote from that report, which is to do with poverty. And it's about, as I mentioned earlier, how you're more likely to be in care if you live in poverty. There it is there. Entry to the care system has a social gradient. The more deprived a family is, the more likely that the children are placed in the child protection register or enter the care system. Every child has the right to a standard of living good enough to meet their physical and social needs, as set out by Article 27 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, the Scottish Government, to its credit, has just incorporated into Scots domestic law the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it's done it properly this time, having previously made a bit of a hash of it. But what it means is that children's rights are able to be enforced in Scotland now. And one of those rights is a decent standard of living, as we've just heard. So it ill behoves Ian Murray to be spending Scotland's money on space projects when he could be spending it enhancing the rights of the people, the children of this country. And what I think will be particularly interesting is if you look at the issues that surround the two-child rape clause, you might very quickly establish that those children who fall foul of that two-child rape clause are not having their children's rights enhanced and protected the way that they should be. And I strongly mm -hmm. suspect that the Scottish government will be open to legal challenge for not mitigating the two-child rape clause in the fashion that they could. You know, what, what we need to see happening in Scotland is people who know what they're talking about being respected for their views and their views and their experience created over decades ought to be utilised by both governments. And in this regard, I'm speaking deliberately about the children's hearing system because it followed on from a report by the Cobrandon Commission 50 odd years ago. 
and it's mm -hmm. about care and protection of youngsters. And where it's important is our youth are the future of our country. And what we need to see is the Scottish Government prioritise their needs and their rights. And Westminster could do the same. Sending rockets into space doesn't do that. Putting food into bellies of hungry children does and creating a proper legal framework for those children does the same thing. So I would commend to everybody who's watching, please, the report that's done, it's called Hearings for Children. It was written in May last year. It followed on about 18 months worth of work. You'll find it on the website for The Promise. And the head of the, the group that wrote it was a former retired sheriff, David Mackey, who worked in Clamanshire for many years. So he knows inside out what poverty does. He knows about the care system and he and the people in the working group understand what the priorities ought to be in a fashion that somebody like Ian Murray, completely, totally divorced from the real world, clearly doesn't. Now, I mean, I, again, I commend any investment, Lloyd. And, and, and Glasgow creates uh, satellites. I mean, probably a lot of the people watching the show would know that Glasgow in Scotland is leading in satellite uh, manufacturing. And that's great. But I go back to the, it seems to be as grabbing a headline as opposed to actually doing anything about poverty. Um, it was kind of sick. Yeah, but I, it's, it's, it's business as usual. It's, it's what we've got to expect. Ian Murray is a very British politician. He knows how to play the British political game. That's why he survived so long uh, at Westminster. He's also a complete party loyalist. His purpose is to get good publicity for himself, but most importantly for the Labour Party. And also he had an attitude of he wanted to hit the ground running. So he immediately went to the reserve powers in the Scotland Act. And one of the ones that uh, has been the butt of a lot of jokes over the years was the fact that space and all things relative to space is reserved to the to the Westminster Parliament. Now, the other thing that Ian Murray knows very well is if you put a story out about space, then you're going to get a headline. You're definitely going to get a headline. And you'll get a headline beyond your own shores. And it's partly for us because we are making a contribution to what's going on up in space from the, the satellite creators in Glasgow and in other places. But what I think here could be happening is that Ian Murray is going to use each section of uh, the reserve powers in Section 5 of the Scotland Act to make announcements, proving that he has the ability to go round the Scottish Government, deliver money which is not through the Scottish Government, which would be, in real terms, collaborative working, but he's choosing not to do that. Uh, and I think Mr. Flynn, with his uh, let's form a four nations commission idea, is falling directly into that trap because what he's effectively saying is Westminster is more important and more powerful than Holyrood. But what he's not doing is finishing that sentence by, and that therefore is an unequal relationship and we require a sovereign parliament. But he's not going to do that. This is... It's, again, and I'll be saying this probably until the next election, it's simply business as usual. We're back to where we were three days before the election. Um, as part of all this, uh, you know, there, there's been a big thing about the, the Labour Party not doing anything about getting rid of the two-child clause, Anne-Marie. Um, in fact, they went at one stage, seven Labour MPs rebelled. Not one of them was Scottish, although the Scottish... Uh, apparently the Scottish party, which doesn't exist, that's their policy, but none of the Scottish uh, MPs voted to suspend it. But these seven were suspended. It kind of tells you that the Labour Party um, are more interested in party discipline than principle, aren't they? Well, I think it definitely highlights that we, we need leaders who can act on their conscience, especially when it comes to safeguarding children. And I think we've saw enough of that with a variety of different topics over the last few years where that hasn't been the case. Um, and I think if MPs feel, feel that they're being unfairly silenced, then, you know, they need, it's necessary for them to speak up in order to restore trust and ensure proper representation for the people that they're supposed to be representing. But I just wanted to highlight that, you know, in the previous talk it, where... Uh, Eva mentioned the report um, by, you know, the 
esteemed uh, Mr Mackey, Sheriff Mackey, who knows a lot about addiction as well, by the way, and how to recover from that, because he sits on the board of Phoenix Futures, one of the best rehabs we have in Scotland. Um, and, you know, this idea of obviously space travel can be exciting, but we've got pressing issues right here on Earth. You know, with so many people struggling with poverty and drug addiction. And actually the promise, you know, like you were saying, that's another report. Another report made by um, a, a very high selection of well-paid middle class um, commentators is that how I would put it and the promise will be studied in social science classes in years to come as one of the most extravagant um, exercises in virtue signaling spin ever created in Scotland. This, the promise was Chief Mammy's um, master, master uh, spin project so again, you know, I just think that we're not prioritising human lives and it should be the, the lives of people here on earth that come first. And I'd like to see the people who are being elected represent the people that they're supposed to be serving and know their paymasters, know their actual party. Is that too much to ask? No, no, in this show it's not. We agree with you wholeheartedly, absolutely. Um, Alan, um, seven of them suspended for having a conscience and for doing the right thing for the poor. That's surely what the Labour Party was founded upon. Well, I've said it before, politics in this country has gone so far to the right that mm -hmm. Thatcher's now on the left. And that's the position mm -hmm. where Labour are just now. They're now actually suspending members for having socialist views. Members who were doing what the Labour Party was founded to do and help the people. Yet the Labour Tories in charge do not find that acceptable. And they were given that power because of the majority that they have. If they didn't have this majority, they wouldn't be suspending any members at all because they would still need them. But they know they don't need these people, so they're just kicked aside. And I would hope that the seven MPs refuse to take the work back because it's time people stood up and said, we're no longer prepared to accept this. Now, mm -hmm. uh, on Ian Murray, in the space project, I wonder if he actually declared an interest, and I do have some sympathy for him, because the poor lad's probably just looking for the planet that he, that he came from. <laughs> I mean, they come from some other planet rather than Earth, because they are not interested in human beings here. I mean, 10 million pounds, how many teachers would that employ? How many nurses would that employ? What would Anne-Marie be able to do with that money? 10.9 million pound. Put it to decent use rather than some little hobby that someone's got. It's time things changed. Yeah, absolutely, 100% it needs to. Uh, Eva, here's the thing, seven of them suspended. Just a few weeks ago, the people in those seven constituencies voted for a Labour MP. Uh -huh. Whether we agree with that or not, it doesn't matter. Starmer has just with, withdrawn that from seven constituencies. I don't know what's that. Half a million people or something, what, 70,000 per constituency? So half a million people have been disenfranchised to uh, to show how, what a big tough guy he is. Mm -hmm. It's actually worse than that if you think about it and look at the detail, because before the election there were a number of Labour candidates who were promising that they would do their utmost to see the two-child rape clause removed. Um, there were many in Scottish Labour who pledged that and they're now being called out for it on social media. We know that Anna Sarwar's position, um, he's claimed, is that he wants to see it go. And the SOP that's been provided to people is that there'll be an overarching review and it'll go then, it'll go eventually. Well, if it's going to go eventually, it should go now. Um, but you're right, people are only getting what they thought they were voting for. But if you think about it, when do you ever get what you thought you voted for? Because with Labour, they promise you the sun, the moon and the stars to get into power. And once they're in power, the real agenda begins to operate. And this is terribly sad, but it is not news. It is not a surprise. It's not any different. It's why so many people didn't come out to vote, because mm -hmm. they were disenfranchised. They didn't find that there was a party who represented their views or would actually represent their interests and 
you know, I know that we'll come on to it shortly, so I don't want to prejudge the issue, but we're, we're learning that Labour don't even understand, didn't even understand prior to the election that there was a black hole in public finances. You know, we're supposed to believe that. They had meetings with civil servants for months before the election when information like this was able to be provided. So, unfortunately, there are many at the top of the Labour Party who are strangers to the truth. You had Keir Starmer in 2023 saying that he would need to take tough decisions if he became Prime Minister. And that was really him starting to say, we're actually not going to be the party of social justice or the socialists that we used to be, in part because so many of us sit in the House of Lords that we've repeatedly promised to abolish. Um, they're obviously still talking in terms of some sort of reform of the House of Lords, but you can whistle for that because, you know, what's that that line um, that they went down to London and they sold out? Because pretty well every single one of them that goes there, no matter what party they're from, sells out. The people of principle within the Palace of Westminster, unfortunately, are very few and far between. We've seen that quickly with this government, probably more quickly than anybody anticipated. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I don't think there's been a big, bigger flipper flopper, Lloyd, than our Keir Starmer. Techie, can you stick up? To, this is from February 20, 2020. We must scrap the inhuman works capability assessments and private provisions of disability assessments, e.g. ATOS, which the Labour started, scrap punitive uh, sanctions to child limit and benefits cap, and then he's suspending MPs for, for doing what he said was going to be a policy. I, I find Keir Starmer quite extraordinary. His, his ability to change his mind uh, backwards and forwards is quite extraordinary, but ultimately when it comes down to it, I don't think we can depend on any promises that Keir Starmer makes because clearly in his effort to become the leader of the Labour Party and then become the Prime Minister, he's effectively prepared to say anything. But I think there are some things that he does say that we have to pay great cognizance to. Uh, and I would say very specifically his um, utterances on the, the nature of the State of Israel uh, and where it fits in the, the world of international law, an area that we would have thought that the current former leader or head of the Department of Public Prosecutions might have some understanding of. But I, 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 I just get the impression that Starmer has done so much to get the job that he's now got that from here on in, he is in hawk to so many of those who've made it possible for him to, to achieve what he's achieved that his focus is going to be primarily on international affairs to some degree, the way some of the past three British Prime Minister have been, with little, de little eye of detail to domestic policy, but an awful lot of spending their time talking about international efforts. And as a result of that, the country is denuded of finance. I mean, it is quite astonishing that there was the vault fast on the, the, the two-child cap but there was also the announcement that we're about to give £3 billion a year for X number of years into the future to another country, namely Ukraine. Now, I don't remember anyone being asked that in the election manifestos, whether or not not providing for those in poverty in our country, not providing the necessary infrastructure, the necessary education, all the necessary things that people at the, 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 the bottom of the ladder require in these circumstances. But we've just committed £3 billion a year to another country to fight a war. Now, th th this, is, this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And people have to get angry about this. It's not, we are not in the business. Our ordinary people are dying because we can't provide them with the necessary supports. But we're going to give money to other people to deliberately go out and kill other people using our money. When there's a claim that, you know, that, that, that Rachel Reeves, there's a, a huge gap in the finances. Well, there's three billion that you could use to, to fill that gap, but they're choosing not to because this is about them playing what they think is big, intelligent adult politics, which is the politics of outside of this country. And it seems for the last three or four prime ministers, if not all prime ministers, that their priority 
is how they see themselves on the world stage rather than the priority being the improvement of the lives of the people that they were elected to serve. And yeah. until Britain or Scotland gets back to the concept of public service in politics, then we're, we, will, we will move from pillar to post, business as usual, same as we are at the moment. Oh, absolutely. In fact, take, take it, um, Eva and uh, Lloyd have mentioned it. Rachel Reeves, can you stick up? There's set to reveal the public for that. Now, this pretending she didn't know uh, Anne-Marie, and, oh, that's a big shock horror, but last week they, they, uh, they put up half a, one half percent um, on the defence budget, which had people say, well, it doesn't sound a lot, Roddy. It's billions and billions. And as, as Lloyd's alluded to, three billion is going to go to, which would have wiped out the two-child clause. Um, they knew they knew the hidden that the finances were bad, but now they're using this as cover so that they can just keep the austerity going and keep pushing down and making us tie our, our belts one more notch. Isn't that the case? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I have some sympathy with the idea of you know Keir Starmer flip-flopping because there's been so much changed in so many different areas and I think he's been elected on a kind of Ming Vaz uh well Ming Vaz strategy you know that he's got to this point but you know the austerity measures obviously they hit the poorest the hardest and that's just simply unjust and the funds that are being sent abroad and earmarked for defence could easily be used for the urgent domestic issues like poverty and the drug deaths and it's about making sure that our resources are used where they're most needed and can do the most good so you know to my mind we should always strive for peace and conflict resolution through you know the world through dialogue and then um, jumping to towards aggressive support for war it, it doesn't help anybody and it totally distracts away from the urgent issues at home like you know, tackling poverty and the drug So our focus, I believe, if I was, if I ruled the world, would be on diplomacy and using our resources to build a just and peaceful society. You know, and I, I do think that so many of our politicians are walking about with a ming vase because they're not being true to themselves. They're not being true to their constituents, and they're not being true to what's good for for you know, for society. And I think if we had people who could first and foremost be true to themselves, whatever that meant, that that would go a long way to helping us all be a lot safer in our communities and a lot more trusting in our communities. And I think we've lost trust. And that's, there's a legitimation crisis in the UK. You know, there really is, we've lost trust in our institutions and that's not a good place for society to be. Uh, Alan, Rachel Rees doing this famous as if shock horror, we didn't know it was bad. If you remember when Labour left office and David Cameron came in, um, I've forgotten his name now, the guy who was in the charge of the Treasury at the time, he left the wee note saying there's no money left. Do you remember that? So uh, they've now come in, it, it is cover for them to keep austerity going. It's Labour at their best. Remember during the 2014 referendum, they said if Scotland becomes independent, you would have a £15 billion deficit. Now we are helping pay off £2.7 trillion of debt that the UK government have uh, increased. Not our government. Our government can't take debt. Our people haven't made this debt. Westminster have. And a lot of it has been done to pay for bombs when the money mm -hmm. should be paying for the burdens of this country to help them out of poverty, to help them get the services they need. And it's just, it's why people do not trust politicians, because they just continuously tell lie after lie. They say whatever they, you, they think you want to know, they want to hear, so they can get elected. And when they're elected for the five years, it's two fingers up to you. I could just do whatever I want now, and here's the austerity on its way. And it'll be austerity on steroids that Labour will bring in. And again, they will spend the next five years blaming the Tories. Of course they will. Of course they will. And when they get into holidays and if things don't change, that's what's going to happen. They'll blame the SNP for everything. That's exactly what they do. That's what the politicians in the UK system do. 
Um, but there is a lot of this going on, Eva. I mean, I also noticed this week that um, all the Scott, it was Scottish MPs, Blair McDougall, the self-confessed liar who admitted telling lies to the Scottish nation during the referendum campaign in 2014, unfortunately, as the Member of Parliament in my constituency. Hello, I'll be back for that one, Blair. You're getting out after one. If there is another British general election, you're out, Scoot, you're out. Um, we'll get rid of Murphy, we'll get rid of you. But him and others were going out with this, um, you know, Gloria Ukraine, uh, victory to Ukraine, and they were all standing with Ukraine flags. And um, so they're definitely, we, we, we laugh when Blair was in about everyone being on message, but it seems that Stammer's got his boys on message more than even Blair had. They're completely on message and utterly obedient um, because they're just towing the party line. They have neither independence of mind nor independence of spirit. And that's particularly troubling when you're talking in terms of a dreadful war, a horrible set of circumstances where so many innocents have lost their lives, lost their livelihoods and where the conduct of NATO and the USA and the United Kingdom is at best highly questionable. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I know a little bit about that the British government did was to provide funding in respect of the investigation and prosecution of war crimes that have occurred during the Ukraine-Russia war. And I hope that that's something that is addressed appropriately and as quickly as it can be. But under no circumstances can I justify can anybody in their right mind justify the enormous sums of money and assistance that's going over there out of our coffers that are supposed to already be empty um, to prolong a war when diplomacy ought to have been deployed a very, very long time ago? You know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of questions to be asked about what's going on there. Um, I know that there's anecdotal evidence about people from Ukraine who've been able to find refuge here and I'm glad that they were able to find refuge here but some of them have gone back to visit Ukraine and I can't understand how they have to leave and come and live here to be safe and live somewhere peaceful but they can still go back and visit on a holiday there's there's something very strange about that it's either a war zone or it's not I don't understand the dynamic no doubt it'll be corrected um, but there's clearly a lot in the background that we know very little about and the detail provided is perhaps deliberately sketchy. Now, it is this, um, you know, we can always find money to, to kill kids, but not pull kids out of poverty, Lloyd. Um, and, and so it continues. Um, but <laughs> what's even more frightening for me this week with the Labour Party, and I'll certainly have to come back to Eva and Will with Anne-Marie on it, was the new Culture Secretary, Lisa Nandy, who said that trans women, e.g. men, um, should be allowed to compete in women's sports. Um, I asked the question now then, Lloyd, if men, because trans women are men, I'm, I'm sorry if that upsets people out there, it's just a biological, scientific fact, they are men. They're allowed to compete against women, adult human females. Why don't we then just allow drugs to be used, uh, enhancing drugs to improve performance. Why is that a no-no when you, you get, lose your medal and get kicked out, but a guy can pretend to be a woman uh, and, and compete? Are they mental? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, <laughs> let's have let's have motorbikes in the cycling. Let's have... Uh, I mean, it, 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 Lisa Nandy, like Keir Stalmer, is someone who... She says what she thinks everybody wants to hear. And now that she's elected, she had to back off a wee bit on the issue of, of uh, the, the gender guff. And now she's putting it right back on the table because she firmly believes in this. It's the arrogance of the, these people who have committed to a biological and scientific nonsense, but who are now digging their heels in, refusing to accept that they were wrong, throwing their hands up and apologising. So it, it's what certainly most people in the women's movement were saying this before, and especially particularly those of the women's movement in England who said, you know, don't listen to a word they say prior to the election on the issues of uh, 
gender recognition, women and uh, men and women's sports and so on, because they'll say anything they want to get elected and then they'll go right back to the ideology that they've all taken on board. And yes, lo and behold, that's that's that that's that's what has come to pass. I think what's going to be interesting for us in Scotland is will the Labour Party in Scotland also pick up on the the regeneration of the the, the GRA arguments? Will they will, will they go along with with Lisa Mandy? Who knows? Look, at it, I just just go back for a second because you know during during the, our, our chat about defence and defence spending, sometimes we, we we get caught up in the numbers and we we we, we get caught up in all oh, the money could have been spent there, the money could have been spent there. Why don't we ask ourselves the first straightforward question? What are we defending? What is defence spending? What is the Ministry of Defence for? Is it to defend the country? So what are we defending? The largest number of food banks that the country's ever seen? The largest number of drug deaths? A quarter of our children in poverty? A quarter of our pensioners in poverty? Are we defending that? Is that what the British military our independent nuclear defence, our £5 million to our £5 billion pounds rather to Ukraine, all in the name of defence. What are we defending that anybody else would want? Because surely the principle always is that defence is to protect yourself from an exterior enemy. And even during this nonsense of the Ukraine war, you will hear people saying, oh, if we don't stop them now, they'll be in Salty Hall Street by Friday. Well, could somebody explain to me why any other country would want to invade the United Kingdom, which is trillions and trillions of pounds in debt? Only Scotland has any natural resources. What are we defending? Are we defending? Is the British government defending the right to keep a quarter of children in poverty, a quarter of our pensioners in poverty, to keep a third of the population down? Is that what they're defending? There's a debate needs to be had in this country, and I mean in Scotland as well as the United Kingdom, about exactly where and why defence is so important to this country. Because when you do some examination of the current state of uh, the Ministry of Defence and all its elements, this is not a country that could defend the Isle of Wight, never mind the whole United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. No, state of our army, they couldn't defeat the Salvation Army. But we ask what we're defending. I'll tell you what you're defending. They are defending Anglo delusion and nostalgia. That's what they're defending. Nothing else. You know, those days of, you know, beating up the, the, the natives have gone. England hasn't actually found a role for itself and it still thinks it's a world power and hangs on to the coattails of the Americans who are just the worst danger to the world going. That's what we're defending. Um, but to go back on track here again, Anne-Marie, um, when you heard Lisa Nandy saying that mm -hmm. uh, trans women should be allowed to compete against women in sports, um, they kept it very quiet during the election. It was something they didn't want to um, talk about. I, um, I think this is a classic case of Labour trying to ride a, what is it, ride a horse? What is it? Um, oh, what is that saying when you say you're trying to ride two horses with one arse? <laughs> Are allowed to swear on this show? Um, so I think she also said in that statement that um, biologic, you know, obviously biological strength, bio, biology matters. So, you know, riding, you know, that <laughs> that expression. And I think I think this, this this strikes to the very heart of the legitimation crisis. I think we're in around trust, right? Because if you're going to kid on to the general public that men can be women and women can be men and that men playing in women's sports isn't it an Orwellian sized lie you know if we can't trust people with the wee things we certainly can't trust them with the big things and I, I just want to make it you know a really strong point here about this these puberty blockers that we are getting range right, these are the same drugs that are used to medically castrate paedophiles. These drugs sterilise children and we are also mutilating them, young people and, and children. And we also remove their ability to have any sexual function and orgasm. 
this is the biggest medical scandal ever in the history of medical scandals. There is nothing bigger than this. Um, uh, you know, this is worse than what Men Mengele did in, in the concentration camps. And if you go along with it, you know, or if you don't go along with it, our institutions will punish you for it. The governing boards and so many organisations, there will probably be an outrage that I've even said this, do you know what I mean? But there's a massive, huge underground market now on these puberty blockers. This genie is well and truly at the bottle and it's going to take a generation. Ah, it's akin to what happened with lobotomies. This is absolutely horrendous what's happening and our politicians currently who are overseeing it could at one day be up on trial, you know, in, in, in jail because of it. So if they don't start to wake up, this the narrative around this is changing, it's coming. People are not scared to speak out about it anymore. The chilling mm. effect is wearing off and more and more people will speak up about it. If we can't trust them with the wee things, how can we possibly trust them with the big things? I agree. Uh, I, I remember, actually, we were talking about earlier in the week about Star Trek and whatnot. I remember a, an episode where Bones, for those of you who don't know, that was a real Star Trek, the original one. The Doctor was talking to Spock and they had someone and they were running at some machine over the guy to fix his brain. He said, you know, in olden days, they used to do a thing called lobotomies where they drilled into people's heads. And previous to that, they used leeches and they laughed. In years to come, it won't be a television series, but it will be people laughing that this kind of nonsense and stupidity was allowed to happen, Alan. I mean, to say that trans women, men, men, should be allowed to run against, cycle against, swim against, play football, play rugby against uh, adult human females, it's just wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, I said Nandy Pandey went loopy loo many years ago. Uh, so did many others. I mean, they keep saying to us that gender and sex are different. If that's the case, why are they always coming after the sex-based rights, the sex-based sports, and the sex-based uh, the sex spaces? Mm -hmm. None do we gender. It's a sexual fantasy of these people. That's all it is. It's not sexual orientation, it's sexual oh, fantasy. Sure. And they're bringing innocent people on board with this. Now, I would say the Labour Party has went back to the 1970s because it's, it's acted very similar to the way they acted with PI, the Paedophile Information Exchange, where they tried to legitimise that organisation. I would suggest the Labour Party, if you want to go back in time, go back to 1945 and be the Labour Party that used to be there, that fought for women's rights, that fought to get us the NHS, fought to get us a welfare system. Go yeah. back to those days and become a real socialist party like people thought they were voting for. Here, here, and I would vote for that party myself, uh, of Atlee. Um, but that's just a fact, Eva. It's just the whole thing is an absolute and utter complete nonsense. Um, that uh, the, the Labour Party is this what the SNP were waiting on that they'll maybe get their GRRB the bill looked on sympathetically by a Labour Party who think that trans women should um, should compete with women. And here's the thing, the Olympics start, which I won't be watching because there's Israel's participating. Um, we have got the paraplegic games which come along next. Why can't we have the trans Olympics and trans swimming and trans sports separate as we do for the disabled? Well, that would enable trans people to take their own genuine whole selves into sports, which is what they claim they want to do when they try mm. to invade women's spaces. Um, I was taken with what Anne Marie was saying there about if you know people tell lies about the little things, you can't believe them on the big things. Mm. She's spot on as usual. Um, a case in point from the Labour Party, particularly, is David Lammy, because you'll remember a wee while ago he said, and I quote word for word, it is probably the case, probably the case, that trans women, that's men, don't have ovaries, but a cervix is something that you can have following various procedures, hormones and all the rest of it. That man is now the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom. How's that for a laughing stock? That's how pathetic it is. Now, if you look to a Scottish context for all of this, 
it's going to be really interesting to see if the SNP do talk to Keir Starmer about reviving the gender recognition reform legislation, what way the other parties in Scotland might jump? Because they all tried to disassociate themselves from this once certain developments occurred, particularly the Isla Bryson carry on. So what I want to know is what the Scottish Government are going to do about rape crisis and particularly Mridul Wadwa. Because earlier this week, Sandy Brindley was interviewed and passed comment to do about rape crisis services and whether women should be entitled to be treated only by or, or get therapy from or consult with women. And she said that she thought that it was quite right that biological men would still have a role to play as staff within these rape services. So I would echo what you said about trans sports. There should be refuges and services for trans people so that trans identifying males or men who say they're non-binary can neither work in nor use or access single sex services that are for women and women alone. Because you see the weasel words of the establishment in Scotland, and this is where blame gets laid fairly and squarely at the doors of Nicola Sturgeon, Hamza Youssef and John Swinney, because they all facilitated it. Rape Crisis said there were no men working within their service on the basis that they considered that Mridul Wadwa, an Indian man who does not have a gender recognition certificate, was actually a woman. That's how they got round it, by saying it's a women-only service because that man is a woman. That is the ridiculous set of circumstances you've got in Scotland today. Now, Mr Wadwa is currently not at his work because there's an investigation or a review ongoing. The quicker that review reports, the better. But who would like to wager me that the content of the review will not be entirely made public and that much of it will be redacted? Yeah, he doesn't have a gender certificate, but he does have a penis. So there we go. Um, the clock is ticking on. Um, so I want to move on, if I may, quickly. This week, um, there was a great irony. The irony of all ironies upon, upon ironies with steroids and stilts. Techie, could you stick up Liam Kerr? Now, this is Liam Kerr, Tory, also Mur Murdo Fraser, um, who still has me blocked. And uh, Russell Finlay, who's running to be the next uh, leader of the Scottish small S, inverted commas, Conservatives, they're talking about they need to have an independent Scottish Tory party, but they'll, they'll let the Tory party, the English Tory party, run for Westminster, but the Scottish Tory party should be independent. Is there not a huge irony, uh, Lloyd, that the Tories see the need for independence, but not for the nation of their birth? <laughs> yes, it's incredibly ironic, but I think there's something else going on here. He knows that uh, under the under John Swinney, the SNP is shifting rapidly towards exactly the same position as the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. So he's wanting to get his independence and maintain the brand before it's taken over by the current MSP for Perthshire. Um, this is just another product of the, 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 the constant ongoing confusion of the unionists in Scotland, um, particularly the conservative unionists, because one of the central principles of conservative you know, ideology is the, the right to personal independence and, and, and matters around that. So that's always been a confusion. But I think Angus Robertson's ears will have popped up at this because... When it all goes very badly in 2026, there are certain people in the Scottish National Party who are going to have to find a new home. And I think it would be made easier for them to uh, make join that new home or move into that new home if it was uh, a Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party independent of Smith Square. And I think Angus Robertson, Pete Wisher, John Swinney, Ben McPherson, any number of them will find a home in the Conservative and Unionist National Party of Scotland. Yeah, I make you vomit. Did you not find a certain irony in that, Anne-Marie, that the Tories are talking about independence for their own party, but not for their nation of birth? No, it made me smile, definitely. I hadn't saw that prior to our conversation, but 
It makes me think, you know, I've been working with some of these Tories up close. Oh, it's tough luck, love. <laughs> with regards to the right to recovery bill that we're bringing to the Scottish Parliament, which I'd love to tell your audience about, but um, I won't on this occasion. Um, I do think that there's a difference between the Scottish Tory party and the, to the party down south. The, the guys that I've met in that party are not representative of the likes of Rishi Shunak, right? They're not billionaires. I feel, it'd be fair to say they're all doing reasonably well financially, but they're no, they're no of the same ilk. They're definitely no. Um, so I do have some sympathy towards that idea. I personally, have found Russell Finlay, the guy who's... Has anybody else put their hat in for the leadership? Was it just him so far? Uh, Pete Wishart, maybe. I don't know. Uh, uh, well, I've found Russell to be an absolute gentleman to work with, actually, and um, he's very much on the side of the people who are desperately seeking help for addiction. So, And he's, he's proven that, unlike other people who have showed up at our events and have had to ask to leave, um, Russell has actually proven his support in many respects. Um, so, I don't know. I can't just say, you know, all Tories bad because that's not been my experience. It really has not been. I've, you know, I was joking the other day that I've seen real Tory tears and everybody who I've spoke to around the drugs issue and the Tory party, they had to convince me that their support for that bill was genuine because I thought initially that it was just a, a political football for them. And I've seen many Tory tears when they told me stories of people in their family and people, loved ones that they had lost, um, and, and hence why we entrusted them with a bill. Um, so I, I can't I can't come down in the all Tories bad side here because it's not been my experience in Scotland and I do think there's a difference. So. I, well, don't you worry about it. I can, I can. I can come against them all. <laughs> Can't stand them. Uh, uh, Alan, did you not find it quite ironic that they're looking for an independent party? I thought it was hilarious. And then the first thought that I had was, well, it'll just be like the Labour and Court party then. They just get absorbed by the Labour party when it's in government because they are the bigger party and they'll still overrule everything they say. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the Tories, I mean, how will they fund herself? Where will their borders be? Mm -hmm. I wonder if they've seen how stupid those questions actually are now. I mean, the, the Tories, it's just, it's a con job. It's, no. they know people know that they're not separate party. They've tried doing what Labour did and call themselves Scottish, but people are now seeing through that as well, knowing that they're, they're actually not a Scottish party, they're a British party. And then they're just trying to con the people. I mean, no. it, th th there is some things that Tories will do properly and that, that need to be done. Because, I mean, some Tories are human. <laughs> no, it's are hard they? to believe, but wow. some, some are. But, I knew that. But I because they get that. one or two things right, the hundred things that they get wrong, I'm sorry, that's what I look at, the hundred things that they've got wrong, the damage that they've done to this country. I'm old enough to remember when they were called the progressives, and they were actually kind of forced into being part of the British Conservative and Unionist Party. And it was probably the last time they ever won an election was when the progressives and liberal conservatives, they were called, were separate from the English Tory party. So that's a fact. As I say, the clock's running. There's a couple of things I want to get in before we go, Eva. And to you, um, it was announced this week by Joanna Cherry. She's moving back from frontline politics, she said. Um, will she be a big loss? Um, um, or will, will we notice no difference? An enormous loss um, to the Women Won't Wish movement because Joanna's mm -hmm. contribution can never, ever... Be understated. Her bravery, her courage, literally under fire, um, has been absolutely awesome. Um, I know that, that, that Phil would disagree with me in some respects, but I think as a woman who's been in politics and in the law, and I, I, I compare myself with, with Joanna and I'm a very, very pale imitation because of her abilities, her skills, her experience, but if you're female and you are gender critical because you tell the truth and you like biological facts, if you're involved in politics and in the law, both remain at the top of your career very male dominated and women do come in for an uncharacteristically and very unfair 
level of abuse and unfair criticism and the ordeals that Joanna has suffered over years, again, should not be underestimated. The fact that she's still standing and she's able to write what she wrote about why she's stepping away from frontline politics is testament to that absolute steel that is within her character. I take my hat off to her for what she's done. I'm sad that she's stepping away from the front line, but I sincerely hope she hangs on in there in respect of women's rights particularly. And I do hope that the loss in Scottish politics temporarily will be the gain in the law again. And I, think, I think you're right, but uh, if I could just add to that, Roddy, I think that her call for reform within the SNP is absolutely vitally important that, you know, especially for maintaining any sort of accountability and integrity, and that reform is absolutely crucial for the party to effectively serve the public and to try and regain trust. So that is necessary. She has not been useful to to my mind, you know, to the um, in terms of like the addiction, the poverty, you know, all that side of things. But like um, Eva said, or she'll independence, a great, a great or independence. Loss. She'll be a great loss to the women that won't wish, but hopefully there'll be other people step up. And I don't know if any of you saw the acronym FILF. What, what was it? Failed in London, try Hollywood. I thought that was an absolutely brilliant. Um, stroke a genius for whoever it was that came up with that because I, I, I think if we start to see anybody who lost their seat um, jostling for one of the Hollywood seats we should cut the legs off them absolutely, they don't deserve it they don't deserve, you know, they let us all down, you know, they went down there they let us all down, they let us down and they shouldn't yeah. get to let us down at the Scottish Parliament I agree, I mean they're changing the rules that they stopped Joanna before that rule was put in place to stop Joanna. Now they're changing it so Stephen can get into Hollywood. I go back. To, I'm halfway. Be, I'm somewhere between you and um, Phil, Eva, because I think you're right. For women, won't preach for for women's rights, for lesbian rights. She was as absolute for, for independence. She was like the rest of them. She didn't do anything. And shouting for reform now after she's out is kind of a bit late. It's like shutting the door after the horse has bolted. And that's she's not the only one that's done that. They've all been doing that, and we've spoken about it in this show. But a lot of them sat silently, taking the check, taking the, the pull audits, being in the Westminster, but they didn't do the one job that they were given, one job only, and that was independence. Nothing else. Anyway, I'm getting myself hit up. Last thing before we go, Techie, I've got one video I'd like you to put it up because this week, Lloyd, disgusts me, makes me angry. Netanyahu got 58 standing ovations in the American Congress. The war criminal, the ICC have declared them a war criminal, that they're committing war crimes, that there's a genocide going on. This is what they're supporting. And these American politicians, because they're in the pay of the Israeli APAC Zionist back pocket, are given this war criminal 58 standing ovations. I am disgusted. How can America ever again expect to be seen as the, the place of democracy, the head of democracy, the head of the West? It was disgusting. Completely disgusting, but, you know, is, is, it, is it any surprise? You know, it's American, no. bomb, it's American bombs that are dropping on Palestinian children uh, from aircraft built in America. The bullets that the guns fire, the guns are American, the bullets are American, or the UK bullets it's i'm not really the person to, to 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 comment on this because having grown up watching the vietnam war on the news at six o'clock when i was but a boy and then seen all the conflicts since since then which america has been party to um i have i've no faith in american politicians i think we, we, we get American politics rammed down our throat because, yes, it's, in, it's important to the British government what is happening in America. Not so much for us, except in terms of the fact that America farts and the, the markets go crazy and a tin of beans goes up in price or oil or petrol goes up in price. But in reality, we have a, we have a, the world has a rose-tinted view of the United States given to us by, you know, its many cultural offerings from 
Hollywood and Netflix and so on. And a lot of that stuff's really good, but don't be fooled. America's not a pleasant country to live in because it's the dog-eat-dog survival of the fittest. Um, a country that believes that providing medical support and aid for your own for the poorest amongst you is some form of communism and, and cuts right to the heart of uh, the American dream. Um, America, America's lost. And I think what's really important is for us, if we are thinking, and we are, about becoming involved in the world as an independent country, then we have to think seriously about what relationship we would have with the current United States and recognize clearly that on our path to independence, your relationship with the United States is very, very important and uh, you have to get it right. But for anyone to suggest that a country that produces good films and good music uh, is also some kind of pillar of charity, uh, that it is the, the home of the free and the land of the brave, <laughs> it's a mythology. And it's as, you know, Phil frequently says it, you know, the quote from George Carlin, you know, America only works when you're sleeping. It's called the American dream. Yeah, absolutely. Eva, you wanted to say something about RFK. Yeah, I've been watching with interest how Robert Kennedy Jr.'s popularity seems to be increasing. And I would like just to remind people of one of the greatest speeches that the world has ever heard. And it was his dad on the occasion of Martin Luther King's assassination. And the words that Bobby Kennedy, obviously subsequently assassinated himself, used are absolutely phenomenal. They were then, decades ago, but they remain so now, and they're so important to the world. And I really hope that his son is a fraction of the man that he clearly was, because what he said was, what we need in the United States is not division. What we need is not hatred. What we need is not violence or lawlessness, but it is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice towards those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. And he said, what we need to do is dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and to make gentle the life of this world. What an aspiration that would be and what a world it would be had we politicians who were people of principle and believed in words of that nature. Unfortunately, RFK is also a massive white Zionist, which is a big problem. He wouldn't stop anything that's going on in his room. That is the problem. Um, Alan, you wanted to add something with the clock ticking. Yes, just means people should remember that America go around the world blowing democracy into other nations. What a cheek they have. And let's, I mean, they stood there and shook hands with a war criminal, because that's what he is. He's a war criminal. But it shouldn't be any surprising, because they've got a convicted sex offender and fraudster standing to be president. Now, we should also remember that America are the country that supports independence for any nation of a communist country, but will refuse to support Scottish independence, Catalonia independence, or, Catal or, or independence from any other Western world. And we should also remember that it was American money that elected Hitler, and that's never changed. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, thank you so much. The clock has beaten us, we've overrun as always. Andrew, a special thanks to you for your debut. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed having you on here. I did, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd love to come back and talk to you properly, Roddy, about the drug deaths and about the right to recovery bill, if you ever have me back. We should do a special on that one. We should do thank a special. I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch and we will do that, absolutely. Once I've read up that a wee bit so I don't look a complete moron. <laughs> anyway, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed talking to my, my friends here. And until we see you, may you and yours stay safe. Bye now. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.